APCO Basic Science Video Postpartum Depression Women are two times more likely to develop depression compared to men, with the greatest difference during the reproductive years. This suggests sex hormones and reproductive events play some role in depression. Peripartum depression is defined by the DSM-5 as the onset of depression during pregnancy or within four weeks following delivery. However, the greatest incidence of postpartum depression occurs two to three months postpartum and can occur up to a year following birth. The objectives of this video are to understand the neurobiological mechanisms underlying postpartum depression, identify changes in steroid hormones in the postpartum period, and describe the pharmacology of SSRIs. To review the clinical manifestations and management of postpartum blues, depression, and psychosis, please see the EPCO educational topic number 29 on anxiety and depression. Let's meet our patient. Ms. D. Preshin is a 31-year-old Gravita 1, now Para 1, who presents to her postpartum visit about eight weeks following delivery. Her labor course and delivery were uncomplicated. She is breastfeeding. She becomes tearful when discussing her mood and reports feeling down most of the time. Her baby has been fussy and she feels guilty that she doesn't want to take care of her infant. She denies feeling of self-harm and denies thoughts of harming the infant. She tells you that she hasn't had any history of depression in the past and doesn't feel like herself. A depression screen in clinic is positive. She would like to know if her mood is normal. You discuss with her that mood disorders are common in pregnancy and postpartum. First, you discuss with her that postpartum blues affects up to 70 to 80 percent of women. Women begin having symptoms two to four days after birth and is characterized by tearfulness, fatigue, irritability, and mild insomnia. These symptoms are usually self-limited. Since her symptoms have persisted, you discuss with her that her symptoms are most consistent with postpartum depression. The criteria for diagnoses are the same that are used to diagnose depression in non-postpartum women, except that it occurs within 12 months of delivery. Postpartum depression is very common and affects 10 to 15 percent of postpartum women. Risk factors for postpartum depression include antenatal depression, particularly for women with depression in the second and third trimesters, depression prior to pregnancy, stressful life events, family history of depression, and poor social and financial support. She would like to know why her mood changed so drastically following delivery. You discuss with her that unfortunately, pathogenesis of postpartum depression is unclear. There are many theories which you discuss with her. First, genetics likely plays a role in the neurobiological mechanisms underlying postpartum depression. There's increased risk in women with a family history of postpartum depression. In addition, there are abnormal neurotransmitter levels and activity. There is an increased density of the enzyme monoamine oxidase A in women with postpartum depression compared to postpartum women without depression. Let's pause, read, and apply. What is the role of monoamine oxidase? Monoamine oxidase, or MAO, is an intramicondrial enzyme responsible for the breakdown of intracellular dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. In this image, the different neurotransmitters are illustrated as these colored dots. An increase in brain MAO increases the metabolism of neurotransmitters, leading to more rapid depletion of these neurotransmitters. Reduced neurotransmitters have also been implicated in major depression in non-postpartum women. Hormones may play a role in the neurobiology of postpartum depression. Women with a predisposition for depression may be more sensitive to large fluctuations in steroid hormones, which typically occurs postpartum. Let's take a closer look. Estradiol levels continue to increase in the third trimester, but drop dramatically after birth, resulting in an estradiol withdrawal state. Cortisol also likely plays a role. Remember that cortisol is considered the stress hormone and is typically released in times of stress. There are high levels of cortisol during pregnancy, with a withdrawal from excess cortisol postpartum. Why is cortisol so high in pregnancy? Let's take a look. Usually, outside of pregnancy, the hypothalamus releases CRH, which feeds forward to the anterior pituitary, releasing ACTH, and then feeds forward to the adrenal glands, releasing cortisol. In pregnancy, this pathway introduces the placenta. There is an increase in placentally derived CRH, which feeds forward to the pituitary, releasing ACTH, and subsequently cortisol from the adrenal glands. In addition, negative feedback of the HPA access during pregnancy is different. Maternal cortisol levels promote stimulation of CRH in the placenta instead of suppressing it, contributing further to high circulating levels of cortisol. 
postpartum, there's a withdrawal which may cause depression in the postpartum period secondary to low cortisol levels. Other hormones, like oxytocin, have also been hypothesized to have antidepressant properties. However, interventions such as administering oxytocin does not improve mood. A significant amount of work has been done with functional MRI to identify brain regions affected by postpartum depression. For women with postpartum depression, changes have been noted in the neural activity and brain regions important for self-regulation, empathy, and emotion. Functional MRI in postpartum depression has demonstrated weaker connectivity among the amygdala, which is the brain center that processes emotions, the anterior cingulate cortex, which connects the emotional limbic system to the cognitive prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, which is important in long-term memory and emotional responses, and the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is important for working memory. Lastly, another proposed mechanism is decreased concentrations of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, a growth factor that has been implicated in postpartum depression. BDNF supports differentiation, maturation, and survival of neurons. After discussing the pathogenesis with the patient, she wonders if she needs treatment. You review with her that treatment is important since postpartum anxiety and depression are associated with many negative outcomes for mothers and infants, including reduced breastfeeding, reduced bonding, negative infant temperament, and abnormal neurodevelopment. For women with mild to moderate symptoms, psychotherapy is the initial treatment. Antidepressants are an acceptable alternative if psychotherapy is not available, not successful, or declined. Combination of psychotherapy with antidepressants may also be helpful. Women that fail psychotherapy or women with severe postpartum depression benefit from pharmacologic treatment with antidepressants. In severe postpartum depression, psychotherapy is almost always an adjunct therapy. When deciding which antidepressant to prescribe, it primarily depends upon prior treatment history and what has worked well for the patient in the past. In addition, if a patient has been on antidepressant medication during pregnancy, it is preferred to keep them on the same one as relapse risk is higher with changing the medication. If a patient hasn't used medication before, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, and bupropion are reasonable options. SSRIs are typically first-line because of their efficacy and because they are fairly well tolerated. Our patient would like to know if antidepressants are safe with breastfeeding. Generally, the benefits of antidepressants outweigh the potential risks to the infant, and the risks are typically low. Sertraline and paroxetine are typically used for initial treatment because adverse effects in infants appear to be low, and there are undetectable levels of the medication in the blood of infants exposed through breast milk. Let's pause, read, and apply. What is the mechanism of action for SSRIs? SSRIs block the reuptake of serotonin at the presynaptic cleft, increasing the availability of serotonin. Let's take a closer look. Remember that low serotonin levels have been implicated in depression. In this image, a presynaptic neuron is on the left and a postsynaptic neuron is on the right. In between is the synaptic cleft. Drawn in green is a CERT transporter. SSRIs block the CERT transporter to decrease presynaptic serotonin reuptake, which increases serotonin concentration in the synaptic cleft. This occurs immediately after beginning the medication. Our patient agrees to a referral for therapy and a prescription for sertraline. You counsel her that it may take several weeks to notice an improvement in her mood. This concludes the APCO Basic Science video on postpartum depression. We have covered possible neurobiological mechanisms for postpartum depression and review treatment options for postpartum depression.